Welcome again to Timberlake Church. My name is Jaron and I serve here on the team. Thanks for welcoming us into your home today. If you haven't already downloaded our app, check it out. It will help you fully engage in our online experience. Select Castle Rock as your campus and click the connect menu option at the bottom of the app. This will give you message notes, giving options, a Bible, and you'll also find a connection card. Please fill out as much information as you're comfortable with. We would love to know you're joining us today. We would also love to hear from you in the comments section. Even though we're unable to chat in person, we would love to hear from you digitally. Let us know where you're watching from and who you're watching with. Comment if something stands out to you during the message. And of course, as always, snap a pic and let us see how you're doing church at home. Thanks again for joining us and welcome to Timberlake.
I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me anything But more than anything I just want you And I'm sorry When I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry When I just sang another song Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you Yeah, I'm sorry When I've come with my agenda I'm sorry When I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started I open up my heart I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to just want you and nothing else and nothing else and nothing else will do I just want you nothing else and nothing else and nothing else will do I just want
Good morning again, Timberlake. My name's Mariah, and we're so excited that you were able to join us online today. I wanted to tell you about a couple things happening here at the church. Father's Day is coming up, and we couldn't be more excited. We've themed Father's Day this year, Dad Ventures, and we've got a few exciting things happening for all of our dads. Make sure you invite your dads to join in on service. It's going to be a special day, and they won't want to miss. We also wanted to say how amazing the church has been during this time through your giving. We believe that based on scripture, that God has called us to tithe, and it's been so amazing to watch the church stay faithful throughout this season. We have a few different ways that you're able to partner with the church through giving. You could do it online, you could do it through the Timberlake app, you could text Timberlake CR to 77977, and of course you can mail a check to our central church office in Redmond. Thank you again for partnering with the church. Because of your giving, we've been able to partner with the Caring Pregnancy Center, the Villager, and have had many other opportunities for the church to be the church. Thanks for staying faithful. Well, Pastor Ryan is about to continue part two of our new collection, Left to My Own Devices. Enjoy the message. Well, hey, church, welcome again to Timberlake Online. I'm so glad that you're here today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for being here with us today. Uh, thanks for taking a part of your morning to, uh, to hang out with us. I hope you've enjoyed it so far. Worship was bonkers, as always. Uh, we have an incredible worship team. I'm so excited that we can have that. I hope that you engaged with us today uh, more than just, just enjoyed it. Uh, it's difficult from our living room, but it is possible, I promise. Um, I hope that you've been in that. Uh, thanks to everybody that came out last weekend. Enjoyed drive-in church with us. It was fun. I hope you had as much fun as we did. It was cool getting to, uh, getting to actually see people um, face-to-face, even if it was, you know, through a, <laughs> through a windshield. Uh, I'm glad that you came out. If you did, if not, you thoroughly missed out, but I hope that you've had a good week, and I'm excited for the next couple minutes that we have together. We are continuing this collection of messages that we began last Sunday called uh, Left to My Own Devices. We're really, we're, we're kind of considering what happens in solitude. I feel like, you know, we're a couple months into this thing, more than a couple months into this thing, and and really, it kind of feels like we're, we're marooned on an island, right? That we are set aside, we're, we're stuck in isolation. And, and really, this, this series is what happens in the solitude. And last week, we kind of considered our response to people, right? I think that this solitude, this isolation is evolving us and it's kind of changing us. And, and we looked at what Jesus said over and over and over again and the fact that he said, love each other. Right? Your response to people is to love each other. I want to take it in a different turn today and kind of consider what, solid, uh, what solitude does to our emotions. Um, I think this season can be rather exhausting. I don't know if you've, if you've felt exhausted yet. Uh, it, it's almost that principle of like laying in bed on Saturday uh, all day long, right? And, and you wake up the next day and you're just so exhausted from sleeping <laughs> the day before. You know what I'm talking about, right? This past weekend, I, was, um, I, I stopped by some friend's house on the way home and uh, and as I'm pulling into the driveway, I was trying to think to myself, I was alone, and, and I was trying to think of myself, the best adjective to describe how I feel in that moment. And I was looking for the superlative, right? Like I wanted the best emotion I could. I wasn't tired. I wasn't exhausted. And all I could settle on was fatigue. I was like, this is what fatigue feels like. And it was fatigue in the in the most pure form possible. This whole thing is, is, is tiring and it's, it's hard to deal with and I think that we're all getting kind of annoyed with it and frustrated with it. And, and at the beginning we were talking about fear and now we're saying, okay, how can we do this safely? How can we reopen and how can we can start life again and go back to work? And I think that we're close, right? We're moving towards that. We've started taking those initial steps. As a church, we're planning, we're, we're watching, we're listening, we're, we're prepping the building for, for the, the near future when that day comes, but, but I think that we're all kind of tired of it, and we're, we're, we're exhausted in this. Maybe we feel fatigue in this. And I was looking at some things today, or kind of considering some things early this week in regards to this, this message and, and that fatigue and things that we're kind of tired of. I started thinking of the, the things in life that I'm, that I'm just over, right? I'm over the Amazon guy showing up at my house with a package 
And I'm out in the driveway, and I think, oh, this is great. And I stroll up to the Amazon guy, and then he stops, and he sets it on the ground and backs away so that I can pick it up. It feels like something that, like, your bully sibling would do, right? But they have to do it, and I get that, but I'm over it. I read an article this week about Zoom fatigue. Has anybody done a lot of uh, Zoom meetings over the last couple months? I saw something that said... uh, People are kind of over the Zoom meetings because there's this this 1.2 second delay on people's responses. And in that 1.2 seconds, the person talking immediately feels like the responder is less friendly and more unresponsive. 1.2 1.2 seconds, right? Like we're kind of over this. We're tired of it. We're exhausted and we feel fatigue in this. The reality is that that emotional exhaustion lies at the foot of burnout, and burnout is a scary place to be. It's a tough place to be. Maybe you're watching here and thinking, okay, this isn't for me. Quarantine has been amazing. Like, I've gotten so much done, and my family is better, and, and life is great during quarantine. Hear me out, okay? There's something for you in this, too. Here's what I love about Scripture. God inspired the words on this page, and And men wrote down these these inspired words, but they're written for us. He divinely designed them for our understanding and our benefit. And scripture is filled with fatigue. Scripture is filled with people that have walked this course and have felt exhausted by life and their situations around them. You look at Moses. Moses at one point was, was so incredibly exhausted that his arms had to be propped up so that he could continue holding them up. You go to 1 Samuel and you find, you find David, king of Israel. He was somebody that, that was living and had, uh, and had led his life with, with passion and commitment and skill. And still the story turns. And there was a period in time where kings went to war with their armies. And yet at this moment, David had stayed behind. He didn't go to war. He stayed home, and we find him sleeping. We find him napping. It says this in 1 Samuel. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and he walked around the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to her. She came to him, and he slept with her. So David sees her on the rooftop, and, and, and he likes what he sees, right, in, in, in idle hands. We're talking about solitude. What happens in, in, in solitude, in isolation, the things that, that we get ourselves into. David finds himself not where he's supposed to be, but he had stayed behind. He saw, he sent, and then he sinned with her. And it kind of snowballs into this, this, this place of destruction in his life. She gets pregnant. He has her husband killed. And really, David ends up in this spot at the end that, that maybe he was in the beginning, this place of, of, of spiritual and, and emotional depth, and, and, and it's a dead end for him. David later has a son called Solomon. He eventually writes the way that David wrote. David had a lot of highs and a lot of lows. He, he wrote from the bottom of the barrel, and then Solomon shows up, and, and there are times when Solomon writes in Scripture from the bottom of the barrel. He writes this book called Ecclesiastes, which is about the most uh, depressing book. He, He kicks off this book by saying this, the words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Let me bring it full circle. Emotional exhaustion brings us to this spot. I don't think that that most of us have stood on our back porch crying out to the heavens, meaningless, right? I don't think that that's us, but where has it gotten us to? 
Have we felt the meaningless, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless feeling before? Usually that feeling comes in the depth of fatigue, of exhaustion, where we can't do it anymore, where we can't take on anymore. David describes himself in Psalm 42. He says, As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. See, I think that there's this this massive lesson that we can learn from both of these people, David and Solomon, especially in light of this specific conversation. Both guys have this This back and forth spiritual life. Both guys have these back and forth personal lives. They get themselves into things. They they get themselves out. Sometimes they're crying out for God because things are meaningless. And sometimes they're saying, man, I'm, I'm right where I need to be with God. They get into it in really every aspect of their life. And you and I, we're not kings. And yet I think our lives look very similar to these two men. I think that we continually go back to a need for something greater, something better, something bigger than ourselves, something bigger to keep our lives on track. Over the course of the book, Solomon is is in this remarkably heavy state. It's a depth book. It's a heavy book. It's deep. It's gut-wrenching. He talks about all the evil that he sees around him. He says, pleasure is meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And then you get to chapter 9, and there's this slight corner that Solomon turns. He says in verse 1, so I reflected on all of this. And I concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands. He says, all of this is meaningless. This is meaningless. This is me- and, he, and he lists this stuff off over the course of these nine chapters. And then we get to chapter 9, and he says, this is what I've concluded. That the righteous, the wise, and everything that they do, it's all in God's hands. That everyone shares a common destiny. It's love or hate in the end. It's heaven or hell in the the end. In chapter 9 and verse 10, he goes on, he says, Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. From the realm of the dead, where are you going? There is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. Fatigue is a sign that we're living for ourselves. Fatigue is a sign that we're not living for our purpose. When we live for our purpose, we find rest, right? We go after rest because rest will propel us in our purpose. When we, when we are experiencing this exhaustion, this fatigue, this spiritual or personal fatigue, it's a sign that we live for ourselves, that, that maybe we're not building or playing into this bigger picture, this past week, I was talking to my dad, and, and uh, I was whining, and uh, I was kind of sitting in my own plight in, in self-deprecation and depression, and we were kind of talking about my own life, personal life, and my journey, and, and how what's happening around me is affecting me, and, and he noted that I'm not really wired for anything else but what I'm doing in life right now that I'm wired for this. And then he said, how cool is it that, that you have purpose, that you know what your purpose is? I truly believe that the antidote to fatigue is purpose. That we take care of ourselves because we want to fulfill this purpose that God has called us to. So how do we re-energize? How do we keep going in said purpose? Four thoughts. First one is this. Start with what's in front of you. Start with what's right in front of you. Look at what Solomon writes. He says, whatever your hands find to do. That means anything you touch, anything that you get it yourself into. Have you been in a situation ever in your life that you didn't choose to be in? Are you in a situation right now that you didn't choose to be in? We get in these spots, these these. These places, and the only thing that we can do is act, to do something. I didn't choose to be here. I have to be here. So what can I do in the meantime? I think it means that we stop looking at at the steps that we can take in the future. Okay, down the road, when we're out of this season of life, when we're out of this this quarantine, this lockdown, the shutdown, these are the steps that I'm going to take. 
I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to, I'm going to get into things more. I'm going to act better. I'm going to relate to people and respond to people differently Like when I get there. I think that Solomon writes, whatever your hands find to do means that we start taking those action steps right now. Those action steps are not for the future. Those action steps are, are, are right now. Some are easy things to do. Some are difficult things to do. I want to change my, my, my bathroom vanity during quarantine. It's yet to be done, right? We want to paint our houses and it doesn't get done. We want to change jobs and it doesn't get done. We, we want to commit to relationships and it doesn't get done. We have these, these personal things that happen. And then it goes to a spiritual level. You know, we, we, we put off serving the church because we think, okay, so maybe when life frees up a little bit, then I'm going to give myself a little bit more to the church. I'm going to start tithing when, when money frees up a little bit, right? We put these things off that God has called us to. I'm going to, I'm going to develop a prayer life. I think, I think that when life settles down, I can have a better prayer life and I can start praying. I can start reading scripture at some point in my life. Solomon says, everything is meaningless. And then he, and then he resolves to just starting. Just start. <laughs> like, everything is meaningless. Well, you know what? I'm going to put everything I have into what's in front of me right now. Nothing will ever be easier until you begin. Here's number two. Live with passion and commitment. I love this next part. He goes on. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. Passion and commitment change the world that we live in. Passion and commitment change the world that, that sits right around side of us, our personal worlds, the worlds that, that we interact with, that we engage with. That word passion comes from the Latin word passio, which is closely related to, to the Greek word for path. Both mean to suffer, that there is a suffering in our passion. When the word is, is, is applied to the mind, it, it can relate to the mind being controlled by emotions. It's not a weak emotion. It's a powerful emotion. It's always a powerful emotion. Passion is powerful. Passion is big. Passion never is quiet and still and calm. Passion is excited. It's ready to go. It's energized. I think that we all have our passions. You know what yours are. I know what mine are. They usually directly uh, guide our steps. They, they move us forward in life, our passions, the things that we care about. I tend to get made fun of in my home for, for how I watch uh, Cincinnati sports. Not that I watch Cincinnati sports, but how I watch Cincinnati sports. Shana snapped this picture of me. Uh, I'll show you this, <laughs> this picture Shana snapped of me last year watching the Cincinnati Bengals game. Somehow, I don't know how it happens, but I almost always end up about 12 inches from the screen um, with my leg propped up on something, right? I don't know how my, my, my foot ends up on the mantle, but, but somehow I end up, this is what I think it is. I think it's passion. And I think that passion directs our steps, and sometimes we don't even know how we got to the place that we're in, but passion has brought us there. When Paul wrote to the New Testament that God gave them up to their sinful passions, he used the word pathos. That word means an affliction of the mind, a feeling in which the mind suffers. It's almost as if passion will cause us some anguish, and yet at the same time, it will propel us forward because passion changes the world around us. It's wild because passion can go in so many different directions and it lands us in so many different spots. It seems to be almost contradictory to what we're talking about today. Fatigue, right? It seems as if passion brings more fatigue and exhaustion on us, that passion and commitment will bring us away from rest. But I would counter and I would say it does the exact opposite. Think about it this way. If you became unbelievably passionate about your spouse, your husband, or your wife, do you think that it would damage your relationship? Or do you think it would propel it forward? Healthy passion, of course. No, not the creepy passion. A healthy passion for your spouse. You'd breathe life into your marriage. 
What if you took that same type of, of, of healthy passion and you applied it to the way that you learned Christ? What if you took that same type of healthy passion and you applied it to the way that you serve as the church? I think it takes us to number three. You have to keep your perspective. Perspective says that healthy passion can light the world on fire while replenishing ourselves. Why? Because I think that God provides that passion for us. I think that God has birthed passion in us specifically and strategically for us. Of course, there's a reason that God told us to, to take a day of rest, to take a Sabbath, but, but there's value in finding what, what your passion is because our passion makes life remarkable. The value that we find in our passion is remarkable because then you begin, you, you begin to develop your life around the things that you're passionate about, around your purpose. It fills us up. It doesn't drain us. It fills us up. It re-energizes us. It makes us excited for something. I think it comes down to the way that we view it, the way that we view God in it. The fact that God created something for us in it. And he adds fuel to our fire when we recognize that he is in it. Solomon goes on. He says, do it with all your might. For in the grave where you're going, it's kind of harsh, there's neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. If you've been in church long enough, you've probably heard the first part of this verse, right? Whatever sits in front of you, do it with all of your might. But then we always leave off the next half of this verse where Solomon goes on. And he says, in the grave, where you're going, you're going to die eventually. There's no planning. There's, there's no purpose once you're there. There's no gaining knowledge or wisdom. It's done. So this is coming off multiple verses where Solomon says, enjoy your life. Enjoy food and drink. Enjoy your marriage. Enjoy your spouse. Do it with all of your might because someday you're not going to be able to. Someday you're going to die and you're not going to be able to enjoy these things. Joy in life is hard to settle on. I'm a frequent to the other side. I'm a frequent to the heavy side, me personally. I battle this. I battle emotional and spiritual fatigue because I tend to drift to the other side. I, I, I take things too seriously sometimes. I'm too hard on myself sometimes. And yet I still, honestly, with everything inside of me, believe that the key is to change our perspective on things. What happens is we go to number four. We keep Jesus in focus. None of this matters. Point one, point two, point none of it matters until we keep our focus on Jesus. Until we understand and learn that our perspective goes towards Jesus. Jesus. Last week I went out of town for an a overnight prayer retreat and, and I spent hours with Jesus in, in prayer and in intercession and I came back so physically exhausted because it was this long night filled with, with some pretty heavy prayer and yet I came back so incredibly replenished. Why? Because I was realigning Jesus where he was supposed to be for my life. And you move past the physical exhaustion. And once you get past the physical, physical exhaustion, you recognize the fact that Jesus is, is still at the center and, and we've placed him and put him where he needs to be in our life. There's something unique that happens. When I say unique, I mean there's something supernatural that happens when we realign and we put Jesus in the seat that Jesus is supposed to be in. Here's what I love about this this relatively heavy book of the Bible that, that Solomon writes, he punctuates it. Solomon puts a punctuation on this, this book of Ecclesiastes. He says, here's the conclusion to the matter. He says, here's the conclusion to the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. Here's the conclusion. Fear God and do what he says. It's with Jesus that that we find real focus. It's with Jesus that, that our focus allows us to find rest and peace and joy and, and, and solace in the fact that he'll sustain us. 
We do everything that we can in life to sustain ourselves. When we're hungry, we, 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 we feed ourselves to sustain, right? When we have fed ourselves too much, we exercise to sustain. We sleep to sustain ourselves for the next day. And yet we so frequently forget that the ultimate sustainer is the one that carries us when we can't carry ourselves. In the book of Lamentations, it says this, because of the Lord's great love, we're not consumed. That's huge. Because of the Lord's great love, we're not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who, whose hope is in him the one who seeks him. Because of his great love, we're not consumed. What does that mean? It means he sustains us. He sustains us for his compassion doesn't fail. His compassion for us sustains us. Let me close it out today like this. I know that this season has been tough. I know that this season has has been wearisome, it's been heavy, but his compassions are new every morning. It says, for his compassions never fail, though they're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. He's faithful to continue to sustain us. This season has been rough, but you know what that means? It means that every morning we wake up, and no matter what we're dealing with, he renews his, his compassion for us. He renews them. I think that he changes the way that he cares for us because he understands what we're walking through. His compassion says, I get what you're going through. Let me hold you up. Let me sustain your life. Let me carry you through the fatigue. Why? Because you have purpose. You've got purpose for your life and it's a God-given purpose. And if God has given us purpose, he's gonna sustain us through it. Come on, that's something to be excited about. That's something to fuel and drive our purpose and, and our passion and our commitment to something greater. Keep your eyes on him because his eyes have never come off of us. He doesn't stop looking at us so long as we keep our focus on him. Come along, let me pray with you. Jesus, thank you so much. God, thank you so much for your passion for us, for your love for us, God, for your compassion for us. God, that it never fails, that every single morning they're renewed. God, that you, you look at us and you care so deeply for us that you, that you just want the best for us. God, and in the best, you've given us purpose. God, you've given us something to strive for, something to long for. Lord, I pray that in this moment, we would begin to recognize the purpose that you've given us. God, in recognizing it, you would help us to understand the necessity for, for rest. God, and rest doesn't mean that we step out of the game. Rest doesn't mean that we stop being who you've called us to be. It means that we healthily take care of ourselves. Why? Because you have called us to something greater. Why don't we say thank you for that? God, we love you so much for that. If you're watching today and you've never said yes to Jesus, the first part of your purpose first part of, of fulfilling your purpose is simply saying yes to Jesus, to the relationship, to the, to the purpose that he has called you to. It's a simple decision where you say, you know what, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to allow God to, to take leadership and lordship over my life. All you have to do right there where you're sitting is say yes. You say, Jesus, yes. Pray this prayer. God, thank you for purpose. God, come into my heart and allow me to begin to fulfill the purpose you've called me to. Forgive me my sins, wash me clean, and take leadership and lordship over my life. And then say thank you, because God is providing for, for you today what you cannot provide for yourself. God, thank you for salvation. God, I pray as we move forward into our week that you would help us to, to clearly see the purpose you've called us to. Lord, we love you so much. Let me ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. 
We hope that you've enjoyed the service. If you made a commitment to Jesus today, we'd love for you to text the number at the bottom of the screen and let us know. You can also jump on the Timberlake app and fill out a connection card. We'd love to come alongside of you in your new journey. Have a really great day and stay tuned in to social media throughout the week for everything that's happening here at Timberlake. And we'll see you next Sunday.